Hello, I'm Harold Jones, Dean of the School of Health Professions at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I want to welcome you to another episode in our ongoing series of interviews with leaders in our school. These leaders are helping to shape the future of healthcare through tailoring innovative solutions to real world problems. Today, we're talking with Dr. Jan Rao. Dr. Rao is the chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy and the director of the UAB Pediatric Tourette Syndrome Clinic. Thank you for joining us today, Jan. Thank you for having me. The first question I want to start with is tell us a little bit about what Tourette Syndrome is. Tourette Syndrome is a movement disorder. It's classified as a movement disorder and um, it's characterized by having um, at least one vocal tick and one motor tick uh, that persist over the course of a year. Um, there's a difference in Tourette Syndrome and just having a chronic tick disorder. Um, the chronic tick disorder, you could actually have one or the other type of tick, either a motor or a vocal tick, and those don't have to be sustained for the length of time of a year. So in order to have the diagnosis of Tourette syndrome, you have to have one of each type of tick and then also the, the time span of a year. What caused you to be interested in Tourette syndrome and to start practicing in that area? Um, there's a physician here on campus at Children's Hospital, Dr. Leon Durr, and he's the director, the medical director of the Movement Disorder Clinic um, at Children's. He and I did work for years, about 15 years together in the Huntington's Disorder Clinic, and um, that recently um, uh, changed for both of us. And so he contacted me about doing some work with um, his kids that he sees through his Tourette Syndrome Clinic. Um, as an occupational therapist, I'd seen kids over the years in school systems and in private practice with Tourette syndrome, but not, you know, not a large number of, of children with Tourette syndrome. And so when he contacted me about this, and because he is the guy for the entire state, um, the physician for the entire state of Alabama that sees all of these kids, it just seemed like a, a good fit. Um, then he told me about the type of therapy that's going on or that has been going on with adults and we wanted to try it with the, the kids to see if we were getting the same kind of successes and in fact we are. Normally you don't hear occupational therapy associated with the treatment of Tourette syndrome. That's true, um, which is really too bad because for occupational therapists the work that we do with these kids that have Tourette syndrome is a perfect fit. Um, occupational therapy, we focus on people's habits and their routines and their occupations. Um, of everyday life and that's exactly what we're doing with these kids that have Tourette syndrome. We're looking at how their tics impair or just maybe um, interfere with their daily occupations of school, you know, being a student, um, playing sports, um, just being with their friends, hanging out and being with their friends and not being embarrassed socially because of their tics. So it's a perfect fit for OTs but we're actually the only OTs in the country that have an organized program like this. Tell us a little bit about the special services that are delivered in the Tourette Syndrome Clinic uh, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Okay. We modeled our program after the program that is happening at Milwaukee um, with Dr. Doug Woods, who's one of the pioneers of this um, comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics. Um, and so our, he works with both adults and children, and our program is only pediatric. Um, so it's an eight session program over the course of 10 weeks, and we actually teach the kids various strategies to um, interrupt, if you will, their tics. Um, they're not suppressing their tics. They are learning a different way to express the tic. Um, one of the things that happens with Tourette syndrome is that before the tic actually occurs, there's what's called a premonitory urge. And so the children, and they're very capable of telling us what that urge is. And um, it might be, for example, it might be something like if you have an eye blink that's your tic. Um, the urge might be that you feel some type of pressure behind your eyes and that's what makes the kids want to do the eye blink um, because it makes it go away. Now once they have that premonitory urge and once they actually complete the tick they will feel a sense of relief but it's generally not um, felt for very long and so that's why you get the repetitive nature of the tick. Um, what we try to do is match some normal type of physical expression to the urge that they're feeling so that they don't stand out. They, they're actually replacing the tick with something else that's not noticeable, that's socially acceptable, and something that they can control, which is very empowering to them because we, you know, we've been able to do this with kids as young as seven, and if they can learn some type of um, controlled expression of their tick or of that urge, 
then it really makes them feel like they have a sense of control. Uh, could you give me some examples about how you go about managing ticks and controlling them? Um, for instance, if there's pressure behind the eyes and that expression is an eye blink as their tick, then one of the ways that we can help them deal with that is um, one of the strategies is maybe just to focus on something. And that focal point can be anything. So if they're talking with someone, it might be a spot on someone's face or maybe a point behind the person. If they're reading um, and maybe they're feeling that pressure and they're having to blink a lot so they're losing their place and reading becomes a real chore for them, they don't like to do it, it takes them a long time, they can stop for just a minute, focus on something on the paper, the, the urge goes away, they didn't have to blink to tick, they just focus, the urge goes away within say a minute and then they get right back to their reading. They pr have to practice these strategies because your body obviously is always going to revert to the tick. So in order to train your body and your mind, then they have to do practice sessions both when they need to use the strategy to interrupt the tick, but also during times that they're not ticking. Um, and the one thing that we found through our clinic is that ki the kids that have had the highest success rates are those kids who are very capable of talking about what that urge is because that allows us to match a really good response and also those kids that are good about practicing. Just how many children have Tourette's syndrome and what are the age ranges you would normally see in the clinic? Well, Tourette's syndrome is actually uh, common. It's um, about three in a thousand kids. Um, every three kids per thousand um, have Tourette's syndrome. Um, about four percent of school-aged children, that's what it translates to. Um, it's generally seen as young as five or six years of age, but probably not diagnosed more till 9, 10, 11, which is usually the, the highest point of expression of the tics. Um, and then for most kids, it's going to um, be suppressed and, and sort of um, fizzle out, if you will, um, in the early teens. After they go through adolescence and through puberty, then probably that Tourette syndrome is just going to um, um, be exhausted. Um, there are very few children that take their Tourette syndrome into adulthood, and if they do, it's fairly mild. Um, so it's not as uncommon as people think. Um, the tic, and there's such a variety of tics. Like I said, you can have vocal tics, you can have motor tics. Um, we've seen kids through our clinic that have scratching tics, that have jumping tics, um, that have grunting or um, uh, other types of noises where maybe they bark like a dog or they repeat people's words or they repeat their own words or syllables. Um, there are also comorbidities that are very common, uh, commonly associated with Tourette syndrome. So a lot of our kids also have obsessive compulsive disorder. They may have attention deficit disorder and the majority of them have um, a fairly um, significant anxiety level that accompanies this as well. Just how successful is this particular treatment for Tourette's syndrome and if people want to learn more about this treatment and about how they can uh, avail themselves of the clinical services at UAB, how would they go about doing that? Um, our success rate through the clinic has been just phenomenal. We've, um, we started the program in January of 2010 and um, to date we've seen 36 kids through the clinic. Um, Actually, two of those have been more young adults. Um, and um, our success rate has been about 90%. So we're very thrilled with the work that's being done and the success that we're getting um, through the clinic. Um, we've had people come to us from Arkansas and Mississippi. We've had, um, in Tennessee, we've had calls from um, Kentucky and Georgia and um, in, in obviously, you know, people here in Alabama as well. So if people are interested, they certainly can go to the school's website and then go to the Department of Occupational Therapy. We have a Tourette Syndrome link on, on our home site. But they can also just go to uab.edu backslash OT backslash Tourette. Um, on that site, we have downloadable forms that people can um, complete and send to us if they are interested in having, having their child evaluated um, for, our pro for our program. Um, and then also there's just information about the clinic and the, you know, what it costs and the commitment to the family. Once again, thank you, Jan, for joining us today and sharing this important work that you're doing and letting us learn more about Tourette's Syndrome and the Tourette's Syndrome Clinic. Thank you for having me. If you have any questions or comments about this topic, please feel free to contact us at uab.edu slash shp slash contact. And while you're on our website, be sure to learn more about our school. Once again, thank you for joining us. 
I'm Harold Jones, Dean of the UAB School of Health Professions, shaping the future of healthcare through tailoring innovative solutions to real-world problems.